where numerous laborers work together side by side, whether in one and the same process, or in different but connected processes, they are said to cooperate or to work in cooperation. To further understand both relative surplus value and the process of increased productivity, we must first understand some key aspects of the formation of capitalism itself. Marx argues that the first fundamental form of capitalist mode of production is that of the cooperation of labor. That is, capitalism brings together large quantities of workers into the labor process. In the previous part of the book, we saw how medieval guilds and handicraft production limited the amount of workers employed under one master. Capitalism, however, in its growth out of handicraft production and its shift into manufacturing, breaks free from these shackles and aims to employ many workers under one capitalist. This change in the conditions of the labor process allow for larger extensive scales of production and economies as vaster quantities of products being produced allow larger quantities of returns in profit. The simultaneous employment of a large number of laborers affects a revolution in the material conditions of the labor process. While Marx notes that cooperation is the fundamental form of capitalism as a mode of production, he highlights that cooperation, however, is not new and existed in other modes of production throughout history. The cooperation of labor or social labor is itself a social power. It unites many workers together with one goal. It allows for a larger sphere of action over larger spaces and can set masses of labor to work at critical moments, like a harvest, for example. It also has the ability to average out each individual's ability and differences so that a large quantity of workers takes on the form of a social average of the ability of labor. It also allows for the economizing of the means of production as they become used in common ownership by many workers. Cooperation also implies some form of directing authority, someone who can guide the process, like the conductor of an orchestra. Capitalist production only then rarely begins when each individual capital employs simultaneously a comparatively large number of laborers, when consequently the labor process is carried on on an extensive scale and yields relatively large quantities of products. A greater number of laborers working together at the same time in one place in order to produce the same sort of commodity under the mastership of one capitalist constitutes both historically and logically the starting point of capitalist production. While in other pre-capitalist modes of production, cooperation of labor was subordinate to the creation of a definite use value. For example, building a pyramid or hunter-gatherer societies hunting for food. Under capitalism, however, cooperation of labor becomes incorporated into capitalism itself and is restructured and reorganized as a technique to increase the productivity of labor directly. What this means is that cooperation becomes coerced upon the workers as an outside external force, as they now work to the capitalist plan or goal, rather than their own desires for cooperation towards their own wants and needs. The social power of labor becomes a free gift to the capitalist, as they now take advantage of it for their own benefit. Not only does the collective force of labor allow the capitalist to increase production over larger spaces and during critical moments, but the use of cooperation also increases the speed of production. The work of 100 people in cooperation is much more efficient than 100 people working individually or isolated, effectively lowering the amount of time needed to produce goods. Though as we now understand, less time means the product has less value. Also, the social relationship between the workers themselves provides free education and motivation. Workers teach other workers how to do specific tasks and roles on the job, rather than at the expense of the capitalist. The buildings in which they work, the storehouses for the raw materials, the implements and utensils used simultaneously or in turns by the workmen. In short, a portion of the means of production are now consumed in common. The economizing of the means of production 
by employing many workers also means it's more beneficial to the capitalist. For example, it costs less labour to build one room for 20 football makers than it does to build 10 rooms that each contain just two football makers. This obviously to the individual capitalist just makes financial sense. However, we can now understand how this common usage over the means of production also results in the lowering of the value of whatever product is being made. Less constant capital is now being transferred over a greater amount of overall products. The effect is essentially the same as if the means of production costs less. If those industries are directly tied to the commodities needed for the workers self-reproduction of their labour power, then this also results in the lowering of the value of labour power itself. By the cooperation of numerous wage labourers, the sway of capital develops into a requisite for carrying on the labour process itself into a real requisite of production. That a capitalist should command on the field of production is now as indispensable as that a general should command on the field of battle. The work of directing, superintending and adjusting becomes one of the functions of capital, from the moment that the labourer under the control of capital becomes cooperative. During the period that the labourer is working for the capitalist, their labour is owned by the capitalist. And because cooperation of labour under capitalism is used as an outside force towards the capitalist's plan or goal, authority over production forms a top-down structure, removing any sense of democratic decision-making over labour. Marx points out, however, that as the number of workers grow, so too does their resistance to this authority and dominance. This gives rise to a new group of workers created and employed by the capitalist. The officers, managers, foremen, those that oversee the production process and ensure it's going to the capitalist plan, making sure there's no waste of commodities or time by the workers. Labourers now become used against labourers and class antagonisms within the working class are formed as some impose authority and more work over others despite it all being for the capitalist's desire. I'll briefly note here how this also plays back into Marx's theory of alienation that he developed elsewhere. Humans are a social species and labour is a social project. But capitalism manages to drive various hierarchical wedges between people, changing our relationship towards each other, our species interaction, and we become alienated from each other. We see then, however, how authority arises out of its relationship to the conditions of production, and those in positions of authority throughout society are thus directly linked to their own relationship to the production process as a whole. It is not because he is a leader of industry that a man is a capitalist. On the contrary, he is a leader of industry because he is a capitalist. The leader of industry is an attribute of capital, just as in feudal times the functions of general and judge were attributes of landed property.